Hey everyone, it's Matt here with Night Run Studio. For over a year now, I've been working on a puzzle platformer RPG called Willard. But Willard is actually about a lot more than just solving puzzles, grinding gear, and battling enemies. It's also a story-based city builder, where every NPC you meet during exploration is a potential citizen with their own story. And every moment is an opportunity to prepare your village for the next enemy invasion. In the last six weeks, I've started working on the building blocks for this second mode of Willard. In my last video, I implemented a state machine, allowing me to quickly generate new occupations for the villagers. Each villager will be able to unlock different occupations, and will have experience bars that track their skill at each of these jobs. So far, I've created my first four occupations. I can assign these tasks to my villagers through a UI menu, and each job has a corresponding building where they can drop off their resource in order to process it into something the village can use. For this next design sprint, my goal is to make a short playable gameplay loop. This was going to require four key steps. The ability to swap between exploration and building modes with a single button press. A grid system for placing buildings. Pixel art for a whole new set of level 1 buildings made of sticks and stone. A system for holding the resource information. And the ability for Willard to collect resources in exploration mode and then pass those into the city build mode. Let's take a look at how this design sprint's gone. My first task was to create separate exploration and building modes that I could swap between. I loaded in some of my UI and code from Willard's platforming levels and got Willard running around in my village. It was exciting to be able to explore around in the city I've been creating. But there was a big problem. My city building mode requires a boring orthographic camera to detect where it can place buildings. This means it's static looking and everything looks like it's on the same level no matter how close or far away things are. My platforming levels, on the other hand, really depend on a perspective camera and its parallax effect to make the world feel immersive and full of depth. So I had to find a way to harmonize these. I created a camera switching script that allows me to move between play modes by pressing escape. In one, you can run around and look at the scenery, while when you press escape, it switches into building mode. Now it turns on the building UI and changes the camera's mode. This worked pretty great and You've got to admit, the platforming looks so much better with the parallax effect preserved. Next, I needed a grid system so I could place my buildings and detect obstacles. I haven't really done anything like this before, so like I normally do, I started by watching some tutorials. It turns out that Sunny Valley has a series on grid-based placement inspired by The Sims games. I love Peter's tutorials, so I loaded up YouTube and got to work. Day one was exhilarating, as the series introduced me to this arcane piece of witchcraft called a shader graph. It wasn't pretty, but by the end of the day, I had a grid system and was able to move my cursor around the grid and place a building, albeit in the wrong place. Infinitely overlapping. Yeah. Well, the next day I made some improvements to my UI. I advanced my code for checking whether or not I could place buildings. For example, this building that I want to place here is eight squares wide, so if I'm within eight squares of my UI, it won't let me place it. But if I come down below my UI here, I can place it mostly without a problem. Definitely wasn't perfect, but it was a big step in the right direction. However, at this point, things were getting dicey. I have a rule about not using code that I don't understand. I was reaching my limit. For example, this code here for identifying viable placement locations isn't too long at all, but there's quite a few lines here that I don't really understand how they work. I mean, me and ChatGPT hashed it all out, and in theory I understood it, but if I walked away for 15 minutes and then came back, it all turned into an indecipherable arcane wizardry. It performed magic, that's for sure, but I definitely wasn't in control of it. So I decided it was time to cut my losses. I couldn't use code that I didn't understand well enough to adapt for my own purposes. That said, Sunny Valley's videos had given me some inspiration, and now I had an idea of how I could implement the building placement all on my own. I wasn't feeling particularly awesome about tossing two days worth of work, so I spent the rest of the day creating this animated scaffold. To be honest with you, I just needed to do something that I knew would succeed. I made this series of animations and then wrote a little code that advances each animation depending on the percentage of completion that the buildings reached. With that, I had some restored confidence and I was ready to take on take two of building placement. The villager system I created during my last design sprint places villagers by creating a sprite that looks like a specific NPC and then follows my mouse around. So long as this mouse follower sprite isn't touching a ground collider, 
it will spawn a villager when I click on the map. I decided to try something similar for my buildings. This time, instead of creating an elaborate grid system, I just wrote a short script that causes my mouse follower sprite to always move its position to the nearest whole number. That way it looks like it's snapping to a grid. Next, I do the opposite of the villagers. I make sure the building is colliding with the ground. Then I added some extra checks to make sure it's not overlapping with other buildings or resources like trees or rocks. There's still some glitches, but as long as my mouse follower is not touching the wrong colliders, it spawns in a building when I click the mouse. Next up was to create a new set of building graphics for my level 1 buildings, which would be made of stone and sticks. But before I could get started on that, I took a week-long break with my family to go camping and recharge my batteries. While I was away, I took my notebook, and I did a lot of work on character writing and story development while I sat around the fire. An early scene in Willard's story takes place around his friend Martin's cabin, and so when I returned home, I thought a nice task to get me started on this design work would be to build Martin's cabin. I had to make a design choice here. I don't want to litter my map with giant buildings that take forever to navigate the cities. So I decided instead to keep my building exteriors quite small, but allow them to expand somewhat when the player enters. Next, I revised my stone hut, adding a thatched roof. I followed up on this by making a stick hut, and at this point I thought it would be really cool if each building had its own unique scaffold sequence. So I put some scaffolding together, then I created a fenced storage yard, as well as a storage depot for lumber and another one for wood. Making these placeable was pretty easy at this point, as I'd already done all the work with my previous buildings. The hard part, however, was going to be integrating it with my villagers and making it all work together. Now that I had new graphics and the ability to place them on the map, I needed a system for holding data about the buildings and passing it along to my user interface. I started by creating a scriptable object, which is just a database of buildings. This allows me to store all of the information I need for each building. For example, here you can see that I've got the name, the cost, graphic, and other important information about the building. Each building also has an ID number. This just corresponds to one of my building slots in my UI. So if I learn to build a stick hut, slot 0 will become activated and I'll have a chance to place it. Now, when I click on a building slot, it loads a specific building's data into my building manager. When I click on a placeable location, the manager spawns in the appropriate building and then sends that building's information to my resource manager, which updates stats in my user interface. It works! Now that I had placeable villagers and buildings, it was time to take on my goal of integrating it all and making a playable gameplay loop. When Willard begins, you won't have access to many resources and you won't have any villagers yet. This means that Willard and his party members will need to be able to collect resources themselves and put those resources to work. First step was to make resources that could actually be collected. I started by creating these lumber bundles. I already have an inventory system that I created while working on the platforming aspects of Willard last year, so it was pretty easy to hook these up. But I wanted to do something a little different here. I wanted to add an animation when I pick up items, but I don't want to have to create a new animation every time I make a new item. So to save time, I coded my animations. This is the first time I tried doing this, but I really love it. You can see here on my item script that I can select different animation curves. So for example, when the item jumps up in the air, it initially moves quickly but then slows down. Once it reaches its apex, it moves in a linear manner, and then when descending, it starts slow but accelerates over time. This took a shocking amount of coding to smoothly move the item along these different curves and also change its size. Additionally, I need to speak to my inventory script, make sure I can hold the item, I have to handle dropping the remainder if I can't hold it all. That said, I can reuse this script for every single item that I want to pick up for the rest of the game, so this was definitely time well spent. Next, I needed to be able to deposit these items. I created these little depots and gave them an animation to show the player depositing the items. I liked coding the animation so much with my other items that I reused a lot of that code here as well. I also added some additional sprites to the depots, so that they fill up according to the percentage to which the depot is full. Because I'm trying to make my code as multi-purpose as possible, I was able to reuse all of this code for other items and depots. Once the lumber was up and running, I was able to add a similar feature for my food in just a matter of minutes. Now that I can move between exploration and building modes, and the player can collect resources, the next step was to complete the loop. I just had to make the player's resources actually get used to build something. 
Just took a little work at this point, but it was relatively easy to hook up the player's deposits to the rest of the resource system, and you can see the finished product here. At first, I cannot place any buildings as I lack the resources. I can switch into exploration mode, collect some resources, walk over and deposit them, and then repeat the process. Now that I've got over 50 wood, I can go back into build mode. Now it will allow me to build that lumber shed. You can see that it won't let me build them in places that already have resources or that are not the ground. Once I drop the building, my resources are deducted and a scaffold appears. At the moment, I don't have any builders. That's gonna be part of my next design sprint. But if I just cheat the system and tell the scaffold that it has a builder, it will progress to completion, updating the scaffold as it goes and then spawning in the final product afterward. If I wish, I can now go back to exploration mode and load up this new lumber shed with more lumber that I find in the world. Thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. It's been a crazy couple of weeks and I'm really loving how quickly things are coming together lately. Next, I hope to add more playable functionality to the game, fully integrating the villagers, adding a builder occupation. Eventually I want to add hunger meters to my villagers, as well as a contentedness meter, which will drop faster when they go hungry too often and that sort of thing. But those are all topics for another day. Until then, thanks again for watching. Please, if you've enjoyed the video, be sure to like, subscribe, or comment in the comment section. Until next time, this is Matt with Nightrun Studio. Cheers.